Hello and welcome again to our live website teardown. We're excited to have you join us today. I'm Cecilia Haynes, the product marketing lead at Crazy Egg, and today we're going to be analyzing the website of our willing volunteer on fleet. On the call also is our customer success pro, JL Nielsen, and she'll be on hand in case you have any product questions. Now I'm going to hand the reins over to our host so they can introduce themselves. Go for it. Great. Thanks, Cecilia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for uh, chiming in from all over. Uh, appreciate it. And we will dive in. So uh, my name is Sunit Bhatt. I'm the GM at Crazy Egg. Um, I look that blurry in real life, too. Uh, Crazy Egg, uh, right now over 300,000 websites use Crazy Egg today to pay attention to who's visiting their website so they can make the most of every website visit. Uh, that's, that's our primary focus. Our goal is to help you understand who's visiting, what's working, what's not, so you can fix it. Brandon, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Sunit. My name is Brandon Pendulik. I'm the founder and CEO of OpGen Media. What we do is we're a B2B marketing ops and demand gen agency. So we really specifically work with technology and software companies on everything from producing leads, converting leads. We build that attribution models, conversion optimization, you name it. Um, but really focused in specifically on uh, essentially being that marketing ops and demand gen team for, for B2B tech companies. Great. Brandon is uh, you know, brilliant at what he does, but also a good person with incredible patience because he also coaches youth baseball, which I think is just wonderful. With that, today's agenda, we're going to walk through a quick overview of how we think about approaching a website and think about conducting a teardown. Then we'll jump into an on-fleet form and we will uh, discuss it. We'll analyze it. We'll use Crazy Egg to do so and share some insights that we have. And then we'll leave time at the end for, for Q&A. In addition uh, to just looking at some reports, we're also going to show you some recordings so you get a feel of how some of this data can come to life. What is CRO? There's a variety of definitions for it. But at the end of the day, it is a data-backed approach to understanding how people experience your website and convert in pursuit of your goals, the goals you've laid out for them on your website, whether that's submitting a form, transacting online, or even just engaging in consuming content. You can do that in a host of ways. Start with analytics, which are, tend to be visitor reports, high level views of aggregate activity, aggregate scroll behavior, aggregate click behavior, aggregate referral behavior and segment behavior. Then you move into user testing, user experience testing, which can be implicit and explicit. Implicit is just riding shotgun with your users as they experience your site through user recordings, or just asking a question when you have a question to ask or you want some additional information. And then finally, the, the critical step is closing the loop. It's acting on the ideas and inspiration that you have, either via A-B testing those changes or making permanent changes. Feels like a heavy definition. Conversion rate optimization is not uh, the sexiest term uh, and not the most approachable term, which is why we know that only 31% of marketers are even paying attention to why people aren't achieving their goals they've set on their websites. So think about that. If you instantly, if you wanna be in the top one third of marketers, and if you want your website to be in the top one third of websites, if you're simply paying attention to why people aren't achieving the goals you've set out for them on your website, you're automatically ahead of two thirds of your peers. Part of the reason is, again, we talked about the approachability of the term conversion rate optimization. And something we're trying here at Crazy Egg is we're stopping, we're not talking about it as much as tests and numbers and dashboards. And we're really just talking about it in terms of how it can help us understand people, behavior, experiences, and then also drive inspiration so we can make changes that ultimately improve their behavior, those experiences, in pursuit of our objectives. So, look, my hokey definition of CRO is something a little bit more accessible. It's just paying attention, finding inspiration, and then testing ideas and doing it consistently. Uh, that's how I think of conversion rate optimization. That's also more holistically how I think of what you can do to make your website better. In terms of how we approach uh, a teardown or how we approach a customer challenge or a problem, you know, there's, a, there's a great quote uh, by a mentor of mine uh, who says, you know, there's growing recognition that skill most needed today to make sense of the extraordinary unparalleled amount of information at our fingertips, also one of the oldest skills in the world, and that's the ability to formulate and ask the right question. All of us are inundated and overwhelmed with data right now. Um, it's everywhere. So having data is no longer a differentiator. 
the ability to ask the right questions of that data and get the right answers increasingly and improvingly um, is really what's going to differentiate you in the market. So when it comes to approaching a website teardown, we start with really simple questions. You know, what is our goal for the page that we're analyzing, the experience, the flow, the form, the funnel, whatever, what is our goal? Then what are people seeing? Where are people clicking? How does that change based on the audience? This is something that we'll show you a little bit of today, but too often we think in aggregates as opposed to in segments. Uh, and one thing we want to encourage folks to do is show you the power of segmenting, even very simple segments, new versus returning users. Uh, and you can learn a lot about how people are experiencing your site and why. Uh, and that can inform tests that you want to run. How do you fill the spaces between data points? It's summer. I saw a bunch of people on from you know, Pennsylvania, New York, Maine. New I'm in New Jersey. One of the things I love is watching my kids chase fireflies. Uh, and I think of... You know, I think of marketing data too often as chasing fireflies, where you see a flash of light in one place, a flash of light in another, and you kind of have to guess how that firefly got between those two data points. We want to show you some tools you can use to fill those spaces between, so you don't just understand those points, but you understand the actual path and journey between those two points. So I think of our customers a little bit like fireflies. What ideas will make the page better? At the end of the day, we can all have ideas, but how do you then prioritize and choose the best ones? Or at least choose something to get started. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges we've seen is inertia. Uh, everyone can look at the data. Everyone has inspiration. It's taking that next step. Uh, and it's very easy to do that. So with that, we're gonna jump into a CRO analysis of OnFleet. I'm gonna switch out of the deck now and switch to live web pages. So if there's some loading issues, please, uh, forgive me, uh, but uh, I tried to queue this stuff up in advance. So the first thing we do when we go to a page is before starting with the analysis, we click on you know, view URL and we look at the actual page. So we start with what the page looks like in real life. At this point, I'll invite Brandon to share a little bit about the contact form uh, that Option Media has built for OnFleet and tell us about the purpose, the goals, and even a little bit of context on OnFleet. Brandon? Sure, thank you. So I want to start with first kind of just going over OnFleet and, and who they are. So OnFleet specifically, what they do is they work with companies such as grocery stores, retailers, restaurants, you name it, um, on basically being that back-end platform uh, to, to go from basically deliver goods to end consumers locally. So if you're ordering something from a restaurant, a, a grocery store, et cetera, OnFleet is building the platforms for those companies. So their customers really... Um, it could be a mom and pop restaurant. It could be a major grocery chain. So it's going into these businesses and, and providing them this piece of technology. So this form specifically, what it's aiming to do is to educate somebody on what OnFleet is on kind of high level features and benefits, who, um, who this platform is used for, how it's used. But really what this is, is it's a contact sales page, right? So this is a conversion form. This is something that you can send organic and paid traffic to. Um, and really what you're looking to do is get somebody to fill in some information about them, send them to a sales rep and on fleet, and then re begin the qualification process uh, and enter them into the sales cycle. Great. And just in terms of education, uh, I'll scroll down so everybody can see the full page. Uh, Brandon, anything else to talk about on the page before we jump into some analysis? So on the page specifically, you have kind of on the top is just some high level information. As you scroll down, you have some key things that are important for, for every B2B company, right? So you have um, integration, they're mentioning some of the integrations, how it's an enterprise grade. Uh, there's, there's social proof here. So you have clients, and I think one of the important things they do is, as I mentioned earlier, is they have uh, you know, mom and pop restaurants or grocery stores, and they also have large chains and retailers. So they have, some, they have a mix of logos here. They have some more social proof on the review site and then some testimonials on the bottom. So it's kind of, a, kind of getting somebody to get interested, um, ideally waive some of their concerns initially, and then ideally have them convert and enter into, the, uh, enter into their sales process. Great. Thanks, Brandon. And if anyone has any questions as we go through, TM up in the chat. Uh, we'll take a few pauses throughout to answer those questions. And obviously, if we don't get to them, we'll save time at the end. Uh, but Brandon, thanks for that. Thanks for that overview. So now let's dive into some analysis. So you know, the, the first tool we start with is the heat map. And what we've done here at Crazy is we've combined the heat map and the scroll map. That way you can see on the left-hand side, 
the attention that an audience is paying. So this is the percent of audience that is uh, stopping scrolling on particular aspects of the page. So here's 65%. The hotter, you can see it gets to 85. This is the percentage of people uh, who are actually stopping on specific aspects of your page. Um, and then these clusters represent clicks, clusters of clicks. Uh, and that's the benefit of the heat map versus the scroll map sort of juxtaposed. Brandon, what do you see? What are some of the things that jump out at you when you uh, look at this page? Sure. So whenever I look at um, a map like this, the, the thing that I always naturally gravitate towards first is sort of the um, sort of the clusters and the straight clicks. So kind of going in equal and opposite directions. So the first thing that jumps out at me is we have a cluster up top here in the top right hand corner, um, which when we look at this page, a live view is actually the Zonfleet's logo. So if you click on that, you're going to go to a home page. Um, the other thing that I find interesting are, are the dead clicks. So anybody who's clicking on something that's not going anywhere, right? So it's, it's not on a form, it's not on a, an escape button. Um, and we try and kind of infer what they're clicking on and what information they could be looking at. And then um, if, as we kind of scroll down a little bit on this page, I'll point out some of these other examples. So right here, I found it interesting too. So here are, are some dead clicks around streamline operations and, and integrate. Um, and enterprise grade and all that. So what somebody's doing here, at least what we can infer, is they're saying, okay, um, OnFleet can integrate with anything. What types of tools are they integrating with? And they're clicking on uh, here to try and get some more information. They're trying to get a little bit more information on potentially what sort of enterprise capabilities they have and whatnot. And it, you know, it's important to point out that there's not a ton of clicks necessarily, but they're scattered, and it is what people are kind of looking at. Um, and then we can say the same thing on the bottom here too. So we have some we have some client logos. People are clicking on them. Presumably, um, they're not clicking on them necessarily to go to the client go to this client's website, but they're probably looking for a case study or maybe some information on how they use OnFleet. Um, so those are just the the things I like to point out first. And then um, down here to where we have the login button. This is actually really interesting as well because this means if somebody's coming to this page. Um, and we'll talk about this too in a bit as we start to segment some of the traffic. But what we're looking at here is what are they, what's their intention on the page? Are, are they coming here to learn more about OnFleet? Are they coming here to fill out a form? Or in this instance, are they coming here to log in because they're already a current customer and they weren't sure how to fit, you know, come in? Maybe they clicked on an ad or whatever the case may be. But there's a, there's a pretty decent cluster there on login traffic, which is, uh, which is always an interesting aspect. Great. I uh, think that's that's super helpful, and I would I would agree. I think you know one of the things that uh, the key thing we start out with the goal, and and Brandon said at the beginning, the goal of this form is to get people to it's a contact form. We want people to submit the contact form. So one of the most interesting things for me is the scattered behavior and the fact that some of the densest clicks are actually not for the submit or the send uh, that the team is looking for. Uh, the next most interesting thing for me, and and something I always use, and you know I've done probably at this point, you know five, six hundred of these in the past uh, in the past year and a half um, of these conversations. And I think the the interesting thing for me is the reason why we've we've merged these two perspectives, how far someone is scrolling to where people are clicking, is because what you want to find a way to do is align your primary call to action with the maximum point, the highest point where people are paying attention. So right now we know that around this banner is the visual anchor. This headline appears to be the visual anchor on the page based on how many people are paying attention. Ideally, what would happen is your primary calls to action would reside in align with this because people's eyes are naturally gravitating here. So the action you want them to take should be at that eyesight and that eye line. Doing that is something that's incredible because if you move your CTA down even a little bit, you'll basically know that in the past few weeks, you've effectively lost a few hundred, just a few hundred people you've taken away from being able to click in the first place and submit because they haven't even seen the CTA that you were, you were leading people to. So that's something that I always encourage people to, uh, to look at. Um, otherwise, I think Brandon has done a really good job of summarizing uh, you know, some of the power uh, of, of these views and these lenses uh, on a form page. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the scroll map. Um, and I'm going to zoom out on this one, Brandon, but uh, again, folks, the, the whiter and lighter and brighter the color, the more engagement you have, uh, the darker, the colder the color, the less engagement that you have. Brandon, what jumps out at you when you look at the page sort of from this zoomed back uh, perspective, which on the record is actually sometimes where I like to start. Um, Brandon, 
What do you got? Sure. So one of the things that I always like to do when, when kind of going into a new view is you jump back to the goal of the page, right? So the goal of this page is to convert traffic, um, qualified traffic into, into leads and into a contact sales button. Um, one of the things that stands out on this landing page specifically is there's only one real call to action button. There's some, you know, there's login buttons, there's escape hatches, you name it. But what we'd want to do on this, or at least what I would be looking at it for, is look at where else are we getting a good bit of, of people who are actually scrolling down that we could fit in another call to action button. So right, right in that middle area, um, kind of right above the social proof could be a good one to test out. You're getting enough people that are scrolling down. Um, maybe they're not always scrolling back up or whatnot, but we want to give all of our visitors uh, more of a chance to convert and make it easier on them. So that was one of the things that really jumped out at me initially. Yeah, I think that I think that's great. And what I'd say is there's a, a maybe I'll add, I'll actually add the link uh, in our in our takeaways. I'll send an article. It's it's a few years old, uh, but it was written by a, a company named Chartbeat and their data science team. And one of the things they talked about was uh, you know if you you're fewer people scroll down, uh, obviously, but the people that do scroll down are your most engaged people. And for a long time that, you know, we forgot that. So we pushed all of our CTAs to the very top. Um, and then, you know, once people got to the bottom, they could either bounce or they could scroll all the way back up to engage with that CTA. It's why you see the emergence of things like Outbrain and Taboola and all those additional links at the bottom of, uh, of an article is because people tend to be there, people have engaged and read through all the content, they're primed and interested if they haven't bounced yet to convert. So I think Brandon, the idea of adding one, maybe two CTAs here, you have a really hot spot here that could work. Um, and these people are gonna high propensity to convert because they're super engaged and they, they understand what you're about. Uh, I think that's a great idea. So great, great takeaway. Um, I think that's, that's outstanding. Brandon, anything else on the scroll map? Those are my main takeaways, I think, for this specifically. Awesome. All right, let's go to confetti. And we talked a little bit about segmenting. So I'll cover some of what jumps out for me here. But what we're doing with this confetti report uh, is basically uh, just taking the clicks and breaking them down by 22 different, very, 22 different segments and about 100 different filters that you can apply to help you understand, is there some dynamic that changes and breaks down the aggregate view that gives you a real like home run takeaway. And the first thing that, that comes out is, if we look at this and we say, okay, so new versus returning, there's good, there's a really good split there for what is a contact form. I would not want this to be dominant for returning users. Um, and you can see it's really heavy on you. Why? Because it's a contact form. People should submit, and then they should go to a deeper part of your funnel, either in your app or in your experience, or have a relationship with your support and success team. So I like that balance and ratio. But what is fascinating to me is, uh, when you look at the returning, the amount of people who are coming here to Brandon's point and the density of clicks from returning customers who are focused on some sort of an exit, either going back or logging in, signing up or logging in, I think that tells you that you are having some percentage of your audience, 10% um, of your audience, 15% of your audience that's coming to this page is returning and trying to find more information. And the page is not currently designed to give that to them, which represents a pretty massive opportunity. Um, the other thing that jumps out to me is I say the new visitor behavior is kind of all over the place. For a funnel, I would want it to be really densely focused on this. And so new versus returning to see what Brandon was calling dead clicks, stray clicks, um, and even clusters around this. So new people saying this page wasn't enough for me, I need more information, gives you a signal that there's something that you can improve uh, there are opportunities on this page, and one of the most exciting things about um, about taking this sort of approach to your website is you should be energized and inspired when you see some of this data because it just says there are tons of opportunities for you to improve things and for you to fix things and uh, take the next step uh, and generate better goals for your business. Brandon, does anything else jump out for you on this uh, new versus returning? Um, it is interesting to see the differences between the two, especially as we start segmenting through them. Um, I think what's kind of interesting too, especially on the new users, is you have, to what Zinni was saying, you have clicks that are sort of all over. So you have some people, again, that you see hopping over into another escape hatch with the OnFleet logo in the top right. Um, you have people to the left clicking on 
on some of those features and benefits where the bullet points are. So things like that, along with, um, especially down kind of in the middle of the page, we have, again, going back to those integrations and the enterprise grade quality. What that tells me is, is they're, they're still looking for more information, which is totally fine. But one of the things is if they're clicking on something aside from the home page, which is an escape hatch, if they're clicking on areas that, that are not leading to anywhere, a dead click or a straight click, those are opportunities to where you can link out to another landing page or more information. And then you can go in specifically on what they're clicking on. So if they're clicking on the integration button, we'd want to show, you know, what are the integrations that we work with. Um, on that landing page, then you would have uh, links out to other points that we're mentioning here, such as the enterprise grade or, or social proof or things like that. So in this way, you have sort of an orchestrated web of somebody going around um, and getting all the information they need. So when they are ready to convert, which may take them, um, you know, multiple visits or at least checking out a few different pages, they can convert right then and there. So it's always good to kind of use that information to, to kind of optimize not just the, this landing page specifically, but just the entire uh, flow before somebody actually converts. Great. And I think that's, that's one of the things that jump out for me is you see the new visitors and existing, you're like, okay, I have some hypotheses about what people might be looking to do. How can I segment them uh, to understand a little bit more about what, what audience groups and what mindsets are exhibiting what different behaviors? So here we see uh, the top refers that are coming to this page. And you see a cluster. So this is the general behavior. It looks no different than the new and returning cluster we just looked at. When we start looking at Okay, one of the ones that I think was most interesting in the interest of time was when you look at Captera. So you all are doing a lot, Brandon, with uh, review sites. What's fascinating is it's such a tight referral and a dominant referral, and this is exhibiting the kind of behavior that you want. These people are looking for the form and really nothing else. Um, so is this an opportunity to have a tighter form to focus opportunity and focus attention so people achieve without distraction, the objective that you want. Brandon, anything to say about sort of Captera and some of the review stuff you're doing and your reactions when you see this? Yeah, and I, I think one of the reasons too that we're seeing such engaged traffic with Captera is because um, anytime anyone's evaluating a new, a new product or service, they're gonna wanna take in as much information as they can. So Captera is sort of, um, and any re review site they're coming from sort of acts as that initial buffer. So they're getting a lot of the social <laughs> proof with client reviews. They're reading the overview of the company. Um, they might have some collateral they're downloading there. So once they actually take that next step to hop into this landing page, they're pretty engaged at that point. Um, so it's a, it's, a good, it's a good takeaway because now what you could do is you could actually build out a separate landing page for Captera, make things a little bit tighter, as Zunit was saying, make it more focused on the call to action, and then call out specifically some of the things that they're, that they're seeing on Captera just to make it consistent because Wherever they're clicking on, um, obviously that's piquing their interest. We want to make sure that we can deliver them uh, through the funnel through um, through that way by giving them the same information that they're looking for and, and go a little bit deeper. Great. And I think the other thing, Brandon, that you noticed in, is there's no engagement on login. There's very little escape hatch behavior. People trying to leave the page, it's, it's pretty focused. But again, when you see people coming from Google uh, and direct, um, you start to see very different behavior than you do with Captera. You start to see the strays. You start to see people escaping. And what's interesting is we've got the same page for both of those use cases. So this is an example where we can potentially fork and create two different versions of the page and maybe more. What else do you see here, Brandon? Those are good ones. Um, I would like to see too. So on Google, if we could do, uh, you know, differences in paid potentially versus organic, some of those may have some some differences. But I think what what really resonates here is somebody who's coming on from Google. Um, they they have potentially no context. They have some. They're they're looking at maybe some a solution, or they're trying to Google around and 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 kind of sign, just basically they're, they're looking for something. We don't really know what they're looking for yet. Whereas on Captera, we know pretty specifically what they're looking for and we track that and we'll hop, we can hop into the UTMs in a minute too and show how we track that at a more granular level. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting to see here that just the differences in, in each piece of traffic. And then the reason I bring up the UTMs here is because if you're looking at this, what we use these for are, are all of our paid channels, so AdWords, um, Captera, things of that nature. So if you look at, for instance, the branded clicks, these are gonna be coming from Google. And the reason that's important to segment, not just by Google and organic and paid and whatnot, is because this is a, this is a Google ad that we're running for the on-fleet brand name. 
So if somebody is Googling on fleet, that could be for a number of reasons. It could be because they have on fleet and they want to use it. Somebody at work maybe is, is showing them how to use the product or, or they saw on fleet at a trade show and they want to learn more. We don't know what they're coming for just yet. So if you look at the branded terms, while we have people converting on the form, we actually have a, a lot of people clicking again on that escape hatch in the top right hand corner. And then a really um, interesting amount of people too going down to the login traffic. So now that's important because you're actually paying for traffic for that. So you're getting conversions, but you're also getting, uh, you're also paying for existing clients essentially as well. And then when you hop into the logistics and the courier, uh, branded terms. So these are actually going to be coming from Captera for the most part. And, and what that means is they're coming in and looking for a very specific use case of OnFleet. So from a logistics and courier name, um, what we could do is, is taking kind of that initial idea a step further where you have a landing page specifically built for Captera. You can build the landing pages, you can clone those and then build one um, that focuses more on the logistics term and one that focuses more on a courier term and then make sure that that branding's consistent. So that, that to me is a, is a big takeaway there because um, as Zuni mentioned, regardless of the traffic number that's coming on, that's your most engaged traffic. And especially on those branding keywords, people are either searching for you or they're on Captair and they have a lot of context. So those are the ones that you really wanna convert. It's a really high value visitor. Great. I'm gonna do a quick jump through and just, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're focused on uh, clicks and engagement on a form. And the last takeaway for me before we, uh, we'll take a question uh, if there are any, and then we'll, we'll uh, jump into watching some recordings. Uh, but the, the biggest takeaway for me, I think Brandon, and you and I talked about this a little bit, is this is a contact form. And the contact form goal is to get people to spend, in your case, to submit. And you can see that in terms of the number of clicks, whether it's an active link or an inactive, just sort of text link, a straight click, a dead click, uh, send is pretty high. Uh, and, you, and for a form submit rate, it's reasonable for B2B. What's interesting to me is unknown, uh, which we've learned is actually defined as this button on the sales form, uh, actually has 43, uh, actually has 43 clicks, so your most clicks. Um, login, uh, which is at the bottom, uh, has 40 clicks, so is your second sort of most, uh, most clicks. Um, and then actually just this contact sales up here, which isn't even clickable, has your third most clicks. So as a takeaway, I think the segmentation of forms is how do you get people less likely or less wanting to click on these buttons, these things, and more engaged with the actual activity um, and purpose, uh, purpose of the form. And the thing that comes to mind for me is, is the segmentation that we've, we've already discussed. Um, Brandon, anything else to add about the sort of list view? Or um, I think the other thing we talked about was forms, uh, drop down form fields have higher engagement than uh, manual entry, which sounds obvious. But when you look at the total um, structure of the form, uh, you could say, hey, maybe there's opportunities to streamline or modify, depending on where people are coming from. Maybe Captera gets the full amount, uh, maybe uh, you know, a lighter, lower intent referral gets uh, potentially a little bit less uh, or more, depending on your priority. Brandon, anything else to add on that before we take a question and maybe dive into some video? Yeah, just real quick on the form. So um, especially given that it's a B2B context, one thing I always like to mention is sort of that balancing act between wanting as few forms as possible to encourage conversions, but also not wanting to encourage um, conversions for the wrong reason. So the one thing I always like to say really is that this is a contact sales form. So when a lead comes in, it's going to go to a sales rep who will then uh, reach out to that prospect and then either qualify or disqualify them and so on. So you want to have enough information there to where somebody's going to fill it out and actually be interested. But you also want to take a look at what is really killing conversions. And as you need mentioned, the drop down forms of higher engagement than, than blank forms they have to fill out. So if I were looking at this, the first form really, um, you know, could either be the message form or um, one of the ones I did find interesting too. Well, I'll hop on the message form specifically. So if you're having someone fill in context in the message form there, um, depending on how your automated nurtures are going out, it could throw things off a touch. So if somebody mentions their exact issue there and you have a sales rep automatically reach out to them, they might get a little bit frustrated because they've already mentioned the problem that they're looking for. And then you have that automated message that goes out right away. So that's one thing to think about on the back end. But if you look at um, industry and country are the two that really jump out to me because unless you have, um, unless it's being routed to a sales rep based on their response, 
I would say those are two forms that if you're looking to drop, you could drop because you need, when you click on country here, um, if, it, if it'll pop up in this view, see there's a, a massive amount of countries to pick from and that's, that could be overwhelming to a visitor. So if I were to look at cutting some things out, those would be the two. Um, and yeah, even a little bit too on, on, on the industry side, just because yeah. you, know, you can find out quick enough um, what country they're located in and what industry they are. So that's good. I think monthly delivery volume is a really good one because that kind of helps self-qualify a bit. Um, but those are my two cents on the forms where you're trying to kind of keep enough in there, make sure it's legitimately, but not overwhelm somebody. All right, that's great. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna watch some user recordings. So we'll we'll show you uh, you know some of, some of the benefits of watching user recordings after you've gone through and developed and formulated some ideas or thoughts. Before I do that, Celia, is there a question you want us to answer, or should we jump into the recordings? Actually, there is. So on the scroll map, I've been brought up that um, how on the scroll map does the is the most hot area not at the very top of the page? It looks counterintuitive. So if you want to explain a little bit how we kind of do impressions and, and why this could be, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. So actually that, that research report I will, uh, I'll share, uh, we'll, we'll cover that sort of very technically. But the bottom line here is standard web behavior uh, we've learned is uh, people are so used to for a while, but just the top being banner ads and uh, fluffs uh, and just sort of fluff. So the instinct when somebody hits the page is they land and they instantly scroll up. So this is actually rarely, if ever, the hottest part of the page. And we don't count, uh, we count an impression when somebody stops scrolling. So if I were to land on this page and instantly just scroll all the way through, this would be counted as the impression because it's the only place I technically stopped. Um, so that's why that happens. So you will tend to see your hottest spot be eh, pixels down uh, as opposed to uh, right at the very, very top. Um, people see that, but Eh, the truth is they're not paying attention to it. The natural behavior when somebody lands on most websites is to hit it and scroll down a bit. Um, and that's just natural, that's natural behavior and that's where that comes from. And we see that on all, all sites, most sites. Um, okay, uh, that answers, hopefully that answers your question. I, and I, I will get that, I'll get a link to that article from Chartbeat, which I think is amazing and does that. Uh, and it really changed the way people advertise online as well. Uh, realizing that the top banner ad was not actually, it used to be the thing that everybody wanted. Uh, it's not the one that you want necessarily. Bottom right and aligned to engaged content was the most important thing. So where people were paying attention, where you had your hottest content is actually where you want your, is where you want your, your ads to be. So there's some interesting research on that. Uh, let's, let's jump through, we'll watch a couple of recordings. These are a minute, two minutes long folks, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, but uh, let's go for it. I wish we had music playing in the background, but we don't. I'm sorry about that. So you can see sort of people clicking, see the mouse movements. This goes to the stray clicks and then individuals looking at scrolling, zooming. Again, to a lot of the stuff Brandon talked about, uh, trying to click on specific things, looking for information. Hasn't even gone to the forum yet. Fascinating. Again, the bounce, getting people to scroll, like the sort of the ping pong effect. Uh, and to Brandon's point, this person sort of reading, right? Trying to click through, mouse has stopped. There you see the clicks. Bouncing back up. We cover the form fields for GDPR reasons, uh, just, as a, just as an FYI. Okay. So Brandon, any takeaways from that? Any uh, Anything you want to cover on that specific uh, recording? Yeah, what I found most interesting here is, so uh, we mentioned some of the stray clicks, um, and it appeared if on the left-hand side uh, where there's, there's some check boxes for some of the features and benefits, my initial takeaway when I saw some clicks there, and of course this is just one example, but was that somebody would click on that feature specifically to try and learn more. However, in that instance, it almost looked like the individual was using uh, the mouse as kind of a way to sort of guide their eyes and read. So it wasn't necessarily that that person wanted to click through, but you do see it in um, the middle of the page. We have the integration box, the enterprise grade box. So that tells me again, and it kind of just reaffirms what we were saying earlier, that people are looking for more information about that, um, which makes sense, right? If, if you're talking about integration, they want to know what tools are you going to integrate with and what sort of enterprise grade qualities you have and all of that. So I think those are really the two big takeaways and how we can kind of add some more information to, uh, to somebody that's, that's, you know, not ready to convert just yet. 
Yeah, I think there's there's opportunities there at the bottom for, you know, you saw very little interaction with the form. And for me, that means this person is still pretty low intent. So the opportunity to maybe just capture an email address uh, and get them into an onboarding sequence or a drip sequence to educate is also uh, an option. And then pushing to more educational type stuff as opposed to contacting a sales team. So we talked about multiple CTAs on the page. You can have different types of CTAs on the page. So one could be contact our sales team and the other could be, you know, join our newsletter or sign up for a webinar or sign up for a website teardown. Hey, uh, it could be any of those things. So that's sort of what we're, what we're looking at. And that's a fantastic and, point. Just one extra thing to add to those secondary CTAs. You could also since is a contact sales page and sales is obviously looking for um, people to come through. You could even have potentially a live chat window pop up if they scroll down to a certain point or if they're on the site for 10 seconds or something. And that way you can kind of actually guide them along if you have the capacity to do it on sales. Uh, that would be a good option or just need to point, throw in an email um, capture box there at the bottom and, and see if we can get them that way. So, Great. All right, let's watch, uh, watch another one. Again, emphasis on form. Uh, to Brandon's point, people do use the mouse to read. Really down, so we can't see them clicking in and typing, entering. Uh, so this is them sort of clicking through the form, uh, identifying the things they want to do and select. So good engagement with the form. Now you see that that one was really interesting for me because you got you saw a JavaScript error and they didn't realize that the company website uh, was required. So this is where you can sort of get to user behavior stuff. So they tried to go through it, they got a JavaScript error. How could we have let them know that this information was required? So working their way through, heavy sort of form engagement. And again, similar issue when it came to them trying to submit and send. And that's where you sort of get to the idea of uh, just an angry, somebody who's angry or frustrated with the experience. They've now abandoned the form, which is something you don't want them to necessarily do. Brandon, anything else jump out at you on that one? Yeah, that's the big takeaway there. I think if you show that whatever boxes that are required, um, specifically calling that out, and then um, potentially two on the website, uh, making it easier for somebody to, to fill that in. So um, I think that's it. Because if you take that example, that's a, that's a perfect example of somebody that looked like a good fit. They were clearly engaged and then they just dropped off. So you definitely don't want that to happen. Um, and I don't know uh, if, the second, if they would have even fallen into a secondary call to action there because they were trying to fill in the form. So they might have just got frustrated, clicked out of it, and thought to themselves, okay, I have to hop on a call, but I'll come back another day. And then who knows if they come back or not. So making it pretty easy. So, and also weighing how important the website is too, right? So if it is important yeah. and a deal breaker, keep it in there by all means. But if you say, oh, you know what? We can always find that website out later. And you're noticing a lot of drop off. And that's when we really recommend to actually just take that form out specific for, uh, entirely. Yeah. And I guess the question is, if you have website, do you need company name? If you have company name, do you, do you need website? So those are, which one is more critical? And if you have email address, you have the domain, so maybe between email address and company name, you get it. So this is stuff we struggle with all the time, and, and we always try and uh, streamline to, to let our customers know we're being thoughtful about the information they're submitting and trying to translate and do some work on their behalf. Um, we've got two more uh, recordings, folks. Uh, again, no music on any of them. A lot of bouncing around. I mean, that, yeah, that tells you. The user is in search of information. Uh, and I think that's sort of what we're trying to get to is uh, you see examples of uh, people bouncing around and trying to get to uh, trying to get to additional information. Brandon, do you have anything on that one? I think that's the same thing too, right? If, if somebody's looking for more information, you want to study where they're, where they're scrolling and really specifically where they're clicking and then weigh, you know, how you can go in and, and get them that info. Cause clearly on this is there, they're interested, they wouldn't be here if they weren't, and they wouldn't be having that much engagement, but clearly there's something missing. So even if you were just to rework the page a little bit based on clicks, you don't even have to necessarily link out to something, but one of the things I see a lot of people clicking on, I mentioned this a few times, is the integration button, um, and then sort of um, whether they're going down to the logos for social proof. I think what they're really looking for though is 
how are certain companies using OnFleet, and then that'll help them kind of conceptually visualize exactly how they could use it since they're probably saying, oh, this is a competitor to us, or, or they're in the same industry as us, or something like that. How are they using OnFleet? And then maybe we can use it and then get a little more context on to, um, how we can integrate that into, into our organization. Great. Now we got one more. Uh, this is mobile. Not interested in the form. And you saw that behavior. They landed and they just scrolled straight down right away. So these count as views and impressions, but that top of the page wouldn't have gotten an impression for this one yet. So there's a zoom. Another website there. They forgot the website once again. Yeah, and successfully submitted form though. Uh, we got that submission, which was great. Uh, so those are some of the uh, those are some of the recordings. I, I see the same thing again. But you saw that behavior of people landing on the page and scrolling, uh, sort of immediately down. Uh, let me uh, let me wrap wrap this up, and then we'll go to we'll go to questions. Um, you know, some of the things, you know, so we, we talked about the, the questions that we, we got and the hypo that helped us form the hypotheses. Why are there so many straight clicks on a form page? Do we know that the most clicked elements would be escape hatches, the login, um, and the sign up? Uh, can a single design successfully serve so many different goals? And what are people actually looking for when they visit this page? Do they want to submit? Do they want more information? Do they want integration information? Takeaways for us. You know, map the design of the page to the intent of the visitor. Segments, referrals, UTM information is invaluable. Think of, you know, multiple, you know, multiple versions. Pay attention to actual user behavior and iterate design based on what users are doing and where they're getting stuck. So think of that form field discussion we just had, but also where people are getting stuck for information and, and just exiting. Embrace the flexibility that digital provides and avoid a one-size-fits-all page. This is the thing that I think is supremely important. Uh, just spin up, you know, it's so easy to clone and copy landing pages and just slightly version them for a specific audience and, and referrals. I encourage you to do that. And folks, this doesn't take a long time. We were talking and trying to explain our thinking, but the truth is I do these on a page basis, probably five to 10 minutes. Uh, and I feel pretty good that I have one or two things that I can focus on for the week. So we talk about the power quarter hour here, which is, you know, hop into a tool like Crazy Egg for 15 minutes a week and then get back to all the other things you have to do. If you do that cadence each week, you're going to find a lot of mind blowing stuff and the highest value things you can impact to improve the experience, just like some of the stuff we talked about here. Uh, with that, we've got some time for Q&A. Um, uh, first of all, before we get into q and I just want to thank Brandon again and, and OnFleet for letting us work with them and being great partners and letting us feature and show actual data. You can see that we focused on a landing page that we wanted something that had a reasonable amount of visits over a few weeks. But even with less than a thousand visits, the amount, it's a landing page. So getting more than a thousand visits is pretty exciting. Uh, but even at that scale, we were able to glean quite a bit of information from a, from a, from a, a reasonable number of visits. You don't need 10,000 visitors uh, to pay attention to what's happening and learn something to make changes. So again, thanks to Brandon and OnFleet. With that, Cecilia, do we have any additional questions? Yes, can you answer one question about the healthy ratio between visits and clicks? Um, what is, you know, kind of what should people be oh, looking wow. for? Yeah, and uh, what would you recommend there? Uh, you, that's such a great question. We get it all the time. It's really hard uh, to say what a healthy ratio is. Um, and I wouldn't be, because if you think about it, um, a healthy ratio is different for an enterprise company, a medium-sized business, a small business. A healthy ratio is different for a content company versus an e-commerce company versus a professional services company that's trying to get an online conversion. And then whether it's a new business or an old business, and then on the page, is it a product page? Is it a download page? Is it a mid-funnel micro-conversion page? Is it the ultimate conversion page? When you start putting all those things together, it's really, it's really hard for me to give you an answer without knowing your business specifically and your goals. So my feedback to you is I wouldn't worry about a healthy, absolute uh, conversion rate. I would focus on getting a healthier conversion rate consistently by looking at your page and just focusing on what you can improve and do better. It's an ongoing exercise. And I know this sounds like, you know, a doctor telling you to, you know, um, 
take your vitamins and, and eat your vegetables, but it's an ongoing exercise. And just focus on, if you focus on being healthier, identifying the obvious thing that is getting someone stuck, that if you were to remove, you would improve conversion rates, like things will be better. I'll tell you a crazy egg. Like we just removed, tested removing a bunch of address fields that we just don't need anymore. We're a 100% remote company. From the domain somebody submits, we kind of know what country they're in. So we're like, why are we asking people all this address information? We pulled it out and our conversion rate spiked. I think it was like 40% or something like that. And it took us two days to figure that out. So I, I, I apologize. I can't give you a, an, a straight answer for healthy conversion rate. What I can tell you is if you make your process about focusing on ongoing healthier conversion rates, you're going to feel great and you're going to improve your business. Brandon, do you have anything to add to that? I think that's spot on. Um, and to your point too, it's also going to depend on, on the page and the actual call to action, right? So if you have something yeah. like the contact sales page that we went over, naturally you're going to most likely get a lower conversion rate on that versus even a free trial or um, especially so on something that's, you know, just downloading a piece of content, for example. So it's going to depend on the form fields and, and, and what the actual call to action is. But I think your point of just trying to set a benchmark of, of where you're at and then improve that little by little. And I think really the best way to do that because it can get overwhelming at times is um, what Zini was saying earlier, you spend 15 to 20 minutes a week in, um, in crazy egg and whatever tools you're using. And then you go in and you work with your head of marketing or design or a contractor or yourself or whoever, and just take one thing a week and then test it out and, and run it and see what you can get. And if it works, excellent, keep it. If not, that's okay too. Um, go try uh, go try what you had next in the queue and then see what happens there. Yeah, I agree. And remember, a majority of marketers are not testing. Uh, and that's because they think they're looking for the idea. I love Brandon's idea of just find, find the one thing that you feel really excited about and confident about. Launch it, test it, and you'll learn from it. If it doesn't work, it's going to make you smarter about the next experiment you run. And I would focus on healthier. I hope that doesn't sound like a cop-out, um, but that's, that's, that's how I feel about that. It's a great question. Uh, that's how, there's so many variables, though. That's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So this is actually a traffic-related one. Uh, you touched on it a little bit earlier when it comes to maybe a lower traffic site, but what would you say is a good minimum threshold to reach uh, in terms of getting insights? And if people don't have highly trafficked landing pages, you know, what kind of suite of tools or approach do you recommend so that they can feel confident about the insights that they're getting? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I will say, look, Google Analytics is free like implement Google Analytics. Um, I would start there. Uh, there's a bunch of guides and information uh, about setting up Google Analytics correctly. I believe it's something like 83% of Google Analytics uh, installations are incorrectly set up. But if you do a handful of things, there's like five, there's a checklist of like five things that you can do uh, that make sure that your Google Analytics is set up correctly. If you do that, then there's no risk. So set up GA, that's the, the first thing that I would say. In terms of like minimum value, a minimum amount of traffic to get value, I'm gonna say something really ridiculous, like 10 visits a month. And if you're getting 10 visits a month, the issue is what type of tools are you using to capture, to analyze that information? You have to focus on the highly qualitative. So in that case, watching videos of all 10 of those users to your website um, is going to be super informative. What pages are they going to? What are they clicking on? What are they not? How much time are they spending? You're going to get rich qualitative data that will work. The second thing I tell you is surveys. Just ask a question. Like what they do, how they, where they come from, why are they here? Ask them a handful of questions. Get a conversational chatbot up there and just interact with them because you have a low enough volume that you can pay even more attention to each individual visitor. So I'm gonna tell you like 10, 15, 20, 25, the issue is the methods you use. Heat maps, scroll maps, all that stuff, not gonna be that valuable. Confetti might be, because you'll see referral traffic. You'll be able to identify where these people are coming from that you may not have expected. And as a result, you may be identify a potential partner, a place you wanna post a blog post, uh, you wanna create a landing page for those people, someone you wanna partner with, whatever. Um, so you could potentially get value from the confetti, but I think the issue is, you know, if you have low traffic, then make it 
uber personal and focus on the qualitative more than the quantitative to formulate hypotheses on how you can scale. Uh, I've been in that situation. Uh, on the side, I write, you know, I write kids books um, and I have, you know, on social issues and I have, I don't have a lot of traffic, but doing and paying attention to the information I just talked to you about helped me identify some nonprofit partners that I could work with um, and modify aspects of my site. And as a result of that, like it's, it's just been helpful. And I was getting, you know, maybe to start like 25 to 50 a month, something like that. So that's my feedback on it. Brandon, I know you deal with pretty high volume um, and some excellent customers, but do you have any feedback on the traffic side? Yeah, I think what you mentioned is spot on. I would say uh, a couple of things on that. So one, when you're looking at it um, inside crazy, the two things that I always naturally gravitate towards, I would say high traffic or low traffic, but especially low traffic, um, is what Zini mentioned when you're actually watching the videos of people going and interacting with your website um, from the recordings and then also the confetti because I love to, to break down what sources they're coming from and try and infer what they're trying to do on the page. But I would say when the lower the traffic, um, I think naturally, and this might be because of the term or because of a lot of blog posts out there, um, when people are running conversion optimization tests, they're looking to change one thing at one time, which is you know technically the correct way to do it. However, when you have low traffic and you're, you're consuming all this information, I would say, you know, don't look to necessarily just tweak one or two things over time. Feel yeah. free to completely change the layout of your page if you see something. So it doesn't have to be optimizing or tweaking. You can do a whole redesign, and that kind of flies in the face of a lot of what um, you see out there. But I think the more traffic you have, the more you don't want to just completely rebrand everything at once. You want to do smaller tests. But the lower the traffic, you know, you can – your first layout or your first take on it might not be what uh, what you're hoping for. So don't feel uh, don't feel scared to completely change something. That's great. Uh, that's really great feedback. Um, just in general, I think CRO feels so technical and tweaky and small dial turning. I think in general, it's important to realize that it should be, it, in some cases, it should be about the big idea and the inspiration and the hypothesis you have and you test it. Um, that's what makes this stuff inspiring and so much fun to do because um, it can truly be transformative. It has the highest ROI of any activity uh, a marketer can undertake uh, based on a bunch of research. So, okay, uh, Cecilia, I, uh, Brandon and I uh, turn it back to you. All right, well, thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. We will be sending a recording out of this webinar teardown. Um, we have live office hours every single week at Crazy Egg, so if you ever want to hang out, ask a question, or just learn a little bit more, you can sign up. Thank you again so much to Brandon and Sneet, um, and again to OnFleet for volunteering. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks again. Thanks, folks. Thank you, everyone.